Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Cheryl Reynolds with the UC Statewide IPM program, and welcome to our UC Ag Expert Talk on pesticide label reading for safe applications. Please note that the webinar is targeted to growers and pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use by homeowners. Today, we're hearing from Lisa Blecker. Lisa is the Pesticide Safety Education Program co Coordinator, and today she'll be speaking on reading pesticide labels for making safe applications. And so now, Lisa, you can go ahead and share your screen. Cool. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here to talk with you. I gotta get my timekeeper sitting here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, reading pesticide labels for making safe applications. And um, this is the plan that I have for us in the next hour. I wanna just briefly go over what is a pesticide label. Um, I wanna talk about what the most, what important information you can expect to find on labels. And in some cases, I'll tell you more or less where to find them. Uh, what is the difference between a pesticide label and a safety data sheet? Um, where are you required to have these pesticide labels? Um, throughout the presentation, I'll be talking about different ways that we are different in California, and that's always important to remember. And at the end, I have some resources for you. So a pesticide label is a complex legal document. It has detailed instructions on how you are supposed to use this pesticide safely and correctly. So it gives you a lot of detailed information about how to make a safe and effective pesticide application. Um, but a key word here is legal. It is a legal document. So the pesticide label is sometimes a combination of, you know, what is stuck on the jug or the box or the bag and like this additional booklet that might pull off. So some sections of the label are required to stay affixed, whereas this little booklet here is expected to come off. So um, I know a lot of times people take that off or it doesn't stay on very well. And please note, you know, the font on these little booklets is really small and sometimes they get lost, but you can always down, you know, um, download the full pesticide product label, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet, either from the product manufacturer's website, or there's some uh, private websites out there that have great label searches, and those are Agrian or CDMS. So you can Google those two resources, and I've had really good success getting updated, um, easier to read labels from them. So it's really important that you read the label before you buy the pesticide, before mixing, loading, applying, storing, transporting. Oh, before and when transporting, pardon my error there. Um, you know, if you're not reading the full label before you buy, you might find yourself in a situation where you can't use that pesticide because you need to use it on a site that's not on the label or in a timing that's not on the label. Um, and knowing, um, you know, all of the label specifications before mixing, loading, applying, storing, transferring, those will give you really helpful information about physical and chemical hazards, how to protect yourself, um, and, and basically just the ins and outs of using this pesticide. So why well, I want to make it extremely clear before I start or before I say anything else is it is a violation of the federal law to use a product in a manner that is inconsistent with labeling. So if you are using a pesticide in a way that conflicts with the label, that is against the law. So the label is the law, it's a legal document. Um, you can add more restrictions on top of what the label says, but you can't do anything that's expressly prohibited or anything that is just not allowed by the label. So it's important to know, um, there are lengthy detailed documents and it's important to be very familiar with um, how they work. 
and what's on there. So I want to go through and talk about laws and regulations in a general sense and related to pesticide labels. So, you know, I like to think of laws and regulations as like a, lay, a layer cake, you know, like think of like a big wedding cake or a quinceanera cake. It's a big cake with multiple layers, right? So if you don't have the bottom layer of cake, there's no cake at all, and then there's no point to this whole exercise, right? So the base layer or the minimum cake that you need is the federal law, right? So in this case, we're talking about FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Um, don't worry, herbicides are regulated by this act as well. So this is just the federal law that, you know, requires pesticide labels to have a certain amount of information. It requires registration of pesticides and certification of uh, applicators and all these things. So um, in all of the states in the United States, we have to, at a minimum, follow the federal law. But in California, we're really lucky. We have another gigantic thick layer of cake sitting right on top of the federal law. So there are many regulations in Title III of the California Code of Regulations that tell us how to safely and effectively and legally use pesticide products. And some of those regulations are not actually written directly onto the labels. So remember, a label is a federal document. It only reflects federal law, and it is the minimum that we have to follow. So we'll have state regulations sitting on top of that. And if you're really lucky and live in a county like Monterey or operate in a county like Monterey, you've got, or any other county, honestly, like has different regulations on top of that. And you as an applicator, as an employer, have the responsibility um, to know what those regulations are and to comply with them. So it's our ag commissioners, or sometimes in some counties are called ag departments, um, that really um, help us comply with these, these uh, county specific regulations. Yay, cake. Okay, so I just want you to keep this layer cake in mind as we go through the, as we go through the presentation. So I have a poll for you just to start off and just um, a quick tip, a lot of times I'm going to ask you a question about content that I haven't yet covered yet, and I'll explain it all, but I just want to see what you know going into it. So, poll one is says, which of the following is considered to be a use that is in conflict with the pesticide label? So something that's inconsistent with the label. Is it using the pesticide to target a pest that is not on the label? Is that conflict with the label? Is it using an application rate that is lower than the label indicates? Or is it using the pesticide on a crop or site that is not listed on the label? Which one of these three scenarios would be a violation of the federal law if you, if you did this? Um, okay, so uh, it looks like I tricked a couple of you. Um, so the actual answer is uh, the number number three answer, which is it is illegal to use the pesticide on a crop or a site that is not listed on the label. And believe it or not, in California, we're able to use the pesticide to target a pest that's not on the label within certain parameters. So um, a good example of this is certain insecticides that are used on citrus. Since ACP and fuller rose beetle are like newer, they are newly important to us, sometimes those labels don't list fuller rose beetle, for example. They are, those insecticides are um, effective against fuller rose beetle. If you, you, so if you follow all of the other regulations, so you're using that pesticide on the crop that is registered, if you are using it at the correct rate, the correct timing, you're following all the instructions, you can actually use it to target a pest that's not on the label. But a word to the wise, you know, if you're targeting a weed with an insecticide, that's like never a good idea. That's not what I mean. So using insecticides to target insects that are not specifically listed on the label. But if you don't have any um, good information 
to support that use, I would, you know, hesitate to recommend it. So um, anyway, so you can actually use it on, um, you know, other insects or other weeds if you're using an herbicide. Okay, so I have another poll. So which of the following must be on the front panel or front page of a pesticide label? So I'm not, you know, these are all sections of the label that you'll find, but which one of them actually has to be on that front page? Is it the mode of action classification? Is it the directions for use? Or is it the active ingredient? Um, looks like I could not really stump very many of you. So the active ingredient is one of those elements that are required to be on the front page of the, or the front panel is what EPA calls it of the label. <clears throat> so there are many sections of the label that are required, right? You have to have them on the label. And within that list of required portions of the label, some of them absolutely have to be on the front panel. So um, I have put on the slides the ones that have to be on the front panel. So um, we'll, we'll go through those. So I just want you to sort of think to yourself what pesticide labels contain. So presumably you guys are pesticide applicators or supervisors or have previously handled pesticides. What is the information that you looked for on the label? What key information have you looked for? So I just want you to, you know, bring it up in your brain, you know, think of the different scenarios where you were looking at labels and what you found on there. So I'm going to go through here different sections of the label indicating which ones have to be on the front page and explaining a little bit more about them. So some labels will have what's called a restricted use statement. And remember, these are federal labels. Okay. So, um, oops, I have a little something that's a little bit incorrect here. I got to correct that. But anyways, some pesticides have what's called a restricted um, use use pesticide statements. So I've given you a little blow up here. And it very specific, it has to be at the very top of the front page of the label, very specifically says restricted use pesticide and for what reason. So these are federally restricted pesticides. So this isn't included. So like there might be some state restricted materials and they won't necessarily have this indication on them. So if you have a restricted use pesticide statement, um, that is a clear indication that this pesticide requires a certified applicator. So that means a QAL, QAC, or a private applicator with the certificate um, that in order to purchase and or use or supervise the use of. Okay, so only certified or licensed commercial or private applicators can purchase and supervise the use of these. And so sometimes these are restricted, considered restricted use pesticides federally, either in the case of this particular pesticide because of um, a high acute toxicity, but there's another pesticide here that is a surface and groundwater concern. So it is known to be found in surface and groundwater. So there, it is therefore um, further restricted. So um, again, this is a federal statement, so there may be some pesticide active ingredients that are restricted at the state level. So in addition, um, so on the, also on the front page, there must be the brand name, and that's just the name that the manufacturer is given um, to this pesticide product. Um, I saw one today that was called Carumba and Cabrio. These are like the catchy marketing names, right? In this case, it's Dacanel Action, okay? So that is just a brand name. It is proprietary to that manufacturer. And so it may um, have different active ingredients associated with it. Um, another thing that's required to be on the front page is the ingredients. So pesticide labels will list the percentage of active and other ingredients by weight. So it's always on the front page so you can get a sense for how concentrated this pesticide product is. So in this particular example, the active ingredient of daconil is chlorothalonil. And it gives you here very clearly 53.94% active ingredient, okay? And then if there are multiple active ingredients, the pesticide label will show you the percentage of each of those active ingredients on there. 
There's also a percentage by weight of other ingredients, and these are just helper ingredients that are in the formulation um, and they, have, they help the active ingredient do its job. But the active ingredient is the actual pesticide um, that is killing the target pest. So something else required to be on the front page of a pesticide label is this keep out of reach statement for children and a signal word. So it's, and they're usually, those statements are usually right near each other and they're always on the front page. So it's keep out of reach of children. And then here in this case, our signal word is danger poison, which is required to be, you know, that particular signal word is required to be in English and Spanish and has to be accompanied by a skull and crossbones. But even if it's a different signal word, it has to be, um, that signal word has to be represented right there with the keep out of reach statement. So I have a poll for you, poll number four, I guess I should say, because they're out of order. So which of the following signal words indicates the least amount of hazard? Is it warning, caution, or danger? Um, so I'm not gonna go into a ton of details because we have another poll right after this and then a slide that will explain everything, but the correct answer was caution. That's the least amount of hazard of these so um, it looks like the majority of you got that correct. So congratulations. Um, so we have another poll. We have poll number five right after that. What does the signal word caution indicate about a pesticide's toxicity? So we said it's least hazardous, right? But what does it mean about the pesticide's toxicity? Does it mean, hey, it's not toxic to humans? Does it mean that it has a low acute human toxicity or that it has a low chronic human toxicity? Um, so I couldn't stump you guys, that's good. So the thing about signal words on pesticide labels, so I already told you they have to be on the front page, okay? And we know that caution is the lowest level of hazard, right, potential harm. So the thing is, signal words are very specifically um, indicative of acute human toxicity and very specifically to the pesticide handler. So the person who is mixing, loading, applying, transporting, potentially exposed to the concentrated product, that signal word is an indication to them what level of toxicity, potential toxicity they're dealing with. Okay, so it's acute and not chronic. Okay, acute means a short term toxicity. So if you spilled pesticides or let's say splashed a particular concentrated pesticide in your eye, that acute hazard is what happens to you right then and there. Whereas chronic is low levels of exposure repeatedly over a long period of time, right? So acute harm, you don't typically, um, you know, experience until, you know, years or months after the, um, the low level exposures. So again, signal words, there are um, three different primary categories of signal words and they are reflective of the acute toxicity to the pesticide handler. So we already saw in the previous example that danger poison um, has to be on the label in English and in Spanish, and also has to have a skull and crossbones. So that is the highest level of acute, potential acute toxicity, right? So danger is also category one. So category one is the, mo the category that is the most potentially toxic. So danger and danger poison are just a little bit different. And I'll explain that in just a second. So warning means a moderate level of toxicity we're talking about the concentrated product. And category three is the lowest level of acute human toxicity, okay? So these acu this acute toxicity and therefore the signal words are based on um, an LD50 value and that's the um, lethal dose that kills half the test population. So um, a lower LD50 means um, just a smaller amount is going to cause a big harm, right? So category one is the highest level of toxicity. 
um, danger and danger poison are category one. Um, it has to have a poison next to it if it's um, a systemic, a category one for systemic toxicity. So category one essentially means a very small amount of exposure to the concentrated product can cause irreversible damage, okay? So with danger poison, that irreversible damage happens to be death. So if it's fatal if inhaled, fatal if absorbed, fatal if swallowed, then it's danger poison, okay? Whereas if it's corrosive, causes irreversible eye damage, it's more likely to be danger. Okay, but category one means a small amount of the concentrated product um, can cause, um, you know, like um, irreversible damage. But please note that caution, just because it's category three, it's the lowest level of toxicity on this chart, but it does not mean non-toxic. No pesticide is non-toxic. They're all um, toxic in, at some level. And that's why we read the label and wear our personal protective equipment and uh, abide by restricted entry intervals and other restrictions. Okay, so something else that's required to be on the front page of the label is a first aid statement, very specifically. So if you have, so there are first aid statements on pesticide labels. Sometimes they're on the first page and sometimes they're on subsequent pages, but typically the first aid is given by each of the four routes of exposure. So in this case, the first aid statement has to be on the front page because it has a category one um, route of exposure. So here it is, we're at category one, danger poison. So those first aid statements have to be on the front page. Whereas um, this second example I have here is for a product that I think is uh, has a warning signal word, and so the first aid statements are you know on subsequent pages. Um, but you'll see for this knock them down mock up label, there's four routes of exposure that you have first aid for because it's different, right? So mouth, um, inhalation, nose, eyes, or absorption through the skin. Whereas this second product. Um, there is no uh, skin absorption, so it must not be very toxic at all through the, the skin route, so there's no first aid statements. But so just a reminder that this is why we, you know, read pesticide labels before we use the products, because sometimes the first aid statements are really severe. They have really strong statements on them, and you don't want to be searching for the label and trying to read it in this really small font when you're in the middle of an emergency. So if something um, like this knock them down um, is danger poison, maybe fatal if swallowed, fatal if inhaled, you know, you want to know that before you do any kind of handling of that pesticide. So you're really uh, intimately aware of what the first aid uh, response is. <clears throat> So the contents of the pesticide have to be on the front pa panel of the label. So in this case, it's a two and a half gallon jug of this Dacanil pesticide. <clears throat> and believe, so EPA registration numbers and establishment numbers are required to be on pesticide labels. They actually are not always required to be on the front panel. But the EPA registration number is the single most important piece of information for tracking pesticide products and getting treated for pesticide exposure. So if you could, if you're in the middle of an emergency and you only have access to one single solitary piece square of that pesticide label, you got to grab the registration number because all of these things that make this particular pesticide unique are tied into that registration number. So this, for example, this is Dacanil Action, right? So I'm not endorsing any product, it's just a pretty label. So it's Dacanil Action. There's Dacanil Flowable, there's Dacanil um, DF, there's all kinds of different versions of Dacanil, but they could all potentially have a different concentration of the active ingredient, some of them might have a second active ingredient. Some of them might have different other ingredients. And you would only know that by grabbing that EPA registration number. 
So the EPA establishment number, it um, identifies a site of manufacture or repackaging. So this is what they look like. The registration number is always reported as EPA REG period NO period. And there's like a series of two or three numbers usually. And then the establishment number is EPA EST period and then some numbers and very often there's a state abbreviation stuck right in the middle of it. And the thing that makes it, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because sometimes pesticides are manufactured or repackaged in California. So there will be a CA right here where you see the TX. And so some people confuse that and they think it's the California registration number. Um, but Typically, you will not find the California specific registration number on a pesticide label. And so if you have to call poison control because you or a colleague at work has been exposed to this pesticide, do not give them the establishment number. That is going to take them longer. Even if the establishment number says C8, it does not matter. It's basically irrelevant for the purposes of handling the pesticide. Really, it's the registration number. Um, that's the most important thing. And so even it's a federal registration number, California registration numbers are all connected to the EPA registration numbers. So that's the most important piece of information on this label in case of any kind of an emergency. So in which section of the pesticide label will you find the required personal protective equipment requirements? Oh the required personal protective equipment for early entry employees. So it's important to note that I say early entry employees. So is it the precautionary statements, the agricultural use requirements, or is it the directions for use? Okay, so um, about, it's like I got approximately a third answering for each one, but the predominant answer was agricultural use requirements, which is correct. So if you have early entry employees, their particular PPE statement and requirements are going to be in the agricultural use requirements box. So the precautionary statements is where you would find the regular personal protective equipment requirements. And we're going to go into that. And then directions for use are more like um, how to specifically use it out in the field, like when you can apply, how much, which crops. So the correct answer is um, the agricultural use requirements. So um, let me just dive a little bit deeper into ag use requirements. So this is the worker protection part of the labeling. So it gives you instructions on how to protect field workers um, and agricultural pesticide handlers. So um, federally, there's a law called, or there's a, a section of FIFRA called the worker protection standard. In California, you know, we have our own worker protection regulations, per, pesticide worker safety regulations. And so they basically replace WPS or the worker protection standard, but we still follow these ag use requirements. So there, here are some really key statements that you're going to find on the agricultural use requirements box. So you'll see something like, do not enter or allow workers to enter treated areas during the restricted entry, entry interval, and then it'll give you a very specific time period. So this particular pesticide is 12 hours. So that means when the pesticide application has been completed for the next 12 hours, that area is under a restricted entry interval and nobody can enter with out some, you know, without some additional stuff. So if somebody's going to enter during the restricted entry interval, they have to be trained as an early entry employee. They have to be at least 18 years old and they have to wear personal protective equipment. So you'll find a statement here in this box. Usually ag use requirements, it's got a box around it and oftentimes it's even grayed out. So it'll say PPE required for early entry to the treated area is. 
And this list of personal protective equipment could be very different than the list of personal protective equipment for handlers or mixers, loaders, or applicators, okay? So it's important to pay attention to this very specific list. So in this case, it says long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves, shoes plus socks, protective eyewear, okay? Which that may be the same or different as the handler PPE statement. So something else that you would find here in the agricultural use requirements box is a federal requirement for posting warning signs. So at the very end of this box, you might see a statement that says, notify workers of the application by warning them orally and by posting warning signs at the entrances to treated areas. So if this Ag use requirements box doesn't say that, it's probable that you don't have to post a warning sign. But of course, we're in California, so that's not always true. But the first place you look to see if you need a warning sign is this agricultural use requirements box. So again, this is just, um, this is where you find a concentrated amount of worker protection information. So PPE for early entry workers, restricted entry intervals, and potentially you'll find a requirement for posting warning signs. So I'm gonna jump back to poll three. Agricultural fields are required to be posted with pesticide warning signs when the restricted entry interval is greater than 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours. Um, okay. So there is a new federal requirement. And so in California, we have to, at a minimum, follow this requirement, and we do. And it states that if the restricted entry interval on a pesticide label is greater than 48 hours, field posting signs are required, okay? So typically, federally, field posting signs are only required if it's stated in that ag use requirements box. So now this is an additional federal requirement that's not on the label. So you just have to know. It's also written into the California code, but that's because the federal law changed very recently. So um, here's how you know if you have to post a warning sign. So if the ag use requirements box says post a warning sign, then obviously you have to post it. There's no hardly any ways around that, okay? So just assume that there's none. Um, in addition to that, if your restricted entry interval is greater than 48 hours, you are also required to post. And so these are in field outdoor settings. So uh, greenhouses require posting um, for every application in California and a hoop house or some other partially enclosed space um, would require posting if the label said or if the REI was greater than four hours. Um, but, you know, we're going to focus on the field use because that's, that's the pesticide labels that I have. So um, remember my layer cake? So anywhere you see this little layer cake off to the side, that's an indication that I'm talking about something really specific to California. So in California, um, we follow the federal law for posts and we have some of our own requirements like the greenhouse thing, but we have our own field posting signs. So these are two field posting signs that are appropriate in California in different scenarios. So you'll notice they both say danger, pesticides, keep out. They say it in English and in Spanish and some of the words are in red. There's also a skull and crossbones, okay? So Federally, there's a sign that has an angry rancher guy who's kind of like pleading with you, please don't enter this field, please. So in California, we're much more direct with our communication and we say, hey, you're, it's harmful to enter this field. So we require the skull and crossbones on our field posting signs. We are not allowed to use the angry rancher guy. Um, other than that, the signs are similar. Um, so you'll notice that this sign right here has additional information that you're required to fill in. So in most, in many cases, you can use either one, but if you use this sign that has the blanks, you have to fill in the blanks. Otherwise, your county inspector will um, be chatting with you. And, you know, that's, 
If there's a blank to be filled in, you have to fill in the blank. So there are just a few situations where you absolutely have to use the sign with additional information required. And that's if your restricted entry interval is greater than seven days. And so that's a California specific requirement. So California has their own posting sign and some additional uh, field posting requirements in addition to what the label and the worker protection standards say. Okay, so pesticide labels also contain something that's called a precautionary statement. And so this precautionary statement, you know, usually is like three main sections. So hazards to humans and domestic animals, environmental hazards or physical and chemical hazards. So the pest precautionary statements describe uh, pesticide hazards of a variety of types. So the most important one to us, obviously, is hazards to humans and domestic animals. Um, and so this is where you're going to find, um, so you've got you know, a signal word, which gives you an indication of its toxicity, but then the precautionary statements go one step further and tell you which of the four routes of exposure it is, it is most harmful to. So it gives you the toxicity information for the route of exposure. So right under where it says warning of ESO, it says <clears throat> may be fatal if inhaled, do not breathe spray mist, causes substantial but temporary eye injury. So it's giving you an indication of what the potential effect is by each of those routes of exposure. And something that's also really notable here is the personal protective equipment. So this is going to be for handlers, mixers, loaders, applicators, okay? Remember the personal protective equipment requirements for early entry employees is in the ag use requirements box. Okay, so here in the precautionary statements, we have personal protective equipment uh, requirements for our, you know, our handler. So I have another poll and I've got my little layer cake up here because I want you to remember that this is a California specific thing. You're not going to always find this on the label. So which of the following is part of the minimum required personal protective equipment for an employee handling pesticides in California? Is it chemical resistance, protective eyewear, or coveralls? Okay, so the majority of you responded protective eyewear, and I'm just gonna like raise the roof on that one. Good job. I hope that means that you're all out there wearing your protective eyewear and requiring your employees to do so as well. So, Let's talk about that. So whatever PPE requirements are on the label, there are some um, California requirements sort of sitting on top of them, but they're invisible and you just have to know that they're there. Um, so in addition to whatever is listed on the label, in most situations, employees handling pesticides in California have to also wear protective eyewear. So if protective eyewear is not stated on the label is not required, you still have to wear it. So protective eyewear is considered safety glasses, goggles, or a face shield, and they just have to have front side and brow protection. They also, they also have to be Z87.1 compliant, and I've provided what I think is a close-up here. It's a close-up of an indication that you can find on safety glasses, goggles, or face shields that this is that is impact resistant. So Z87 plus or Z87.1, it's usually clear raised lettering somewhere on the protective eyewear. It's not always in the same place, but you have to kind of feel around for it and use really good lighting. And so in this case, it's clear lettering on top of clear plastic. And, and that's a very common way to see this. So it's just, it's a measure of impact resistance, which is really important when you're handling pesticides. Um, so these requirements are not written on the label, but you still need to make sure your protective complies with these. So in addition to the protective eyewear, we have to wear chemical resistant gloves. So these are nitrile gloves and they're the most common one used and most common one that are compliant, but that's not always the case. So chemical resistant gloves basically means one of these eight materials. So laminate, butyl, 
nitrile, neoprene, natural rubber, polyeth polyethylene, PVC, or Viton. So with the exception of the laminate gloves and the polyethylene gloves, all of those have to be at least 14 mils thick or thicker. And it's really difficult to do that measurement yourself. So you need to know what the manufacturer's specifications of that glove are when you purchase them. So these requirements are not on the label. You can still layer cake here in the bottom. This is a California requirement on sitting on top of the, the, the label requirements. So if your pesticide label says waterproof gloves, that's not good enough. You have to wear chemical resistant gloves and it has all of these specifications. So the code section that is really important for you is 6738. We also have um, uh, an online class on personal protective equipment requirements. It goes into a ton of detail. Okay, so remember how I said precautionary statements are like three different categories. One is hazards to humans, right? And so we talked about that. It's mostly PPE and how it's going to harm you through each route of exposure, right? So there might be environmental hazards of the pesticide. So for example, this pesticide says this pesticide is toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates do not apply to water or to areas where surface water is present, right? So this, this has a bad interaction with water. If it gets into the water, it'll be toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates. So this is a legally binding statement. This is a statement on the label that says, do not apply to water. If you apply this to water, you have broken the federal law and you can face many fines and consequences because of that. But also you're polluting the water. Um, so another precautionary statement is physical or chemical hazards. And so here's an example I pulled from lime sulfur. I'm not picking on them. It was just a very extreme statement. So it says, do not mix lime sulfur with acids or phosphate fertilizer products because deadly and potentially extremely flammable hydrogen sulfide gas may be emitted. So isn't that really important to know before you start mixing this pesticide or before you try to store it with any of these incompatible materials. Um, so the last major section of the label that I want to talk about is the directions for use, which is, like, is very lengthy. It has a multitude of different requirements on it or instructions on it. So this in this directions for use, it says do not apply this product in a way that will contact workers and other persons. So that's a legally binding statement. And then it gives you the most important thing is the specific crop instructions. So it tells you the specific rate for the specific pest, for the specific crops, and specific intervals. So these are all legally binding. So I wanna go back to one of my first polls where I asked you which is um, use in conflict with the label. Okay, so let's look at this example. So it says grapes and small vine fruits, right? And it gives you some examples. Let's assume this is, these are the only crops on that label. If you try to make this application to, let's say, um, raspberries, could you do that? Or is that in conflict with the label, right? You guys know that, that's use in conflict. So if I were spraying grapes for powdery mildew and I used a product rate, a rate of four ounces per acre instead of the rate that's listed here, that is in conflict with the label. Okay, so that is using a rate above which is legal. Same, if I used two and a half ounces per acre, that's less. That is not a good idea because there are pesticide resistance issues at stake, but it is not illegal. So you can be less restrictive than the label, but not, no, you can be more restrictive than the label, but never less. Um, and if there were another disease of grapes and small vine fruits that acted like powdery mildew, you could choose that powdery mildew rate and target that pest with this application. But you can't use it on a crop or a site that's not here, and you cannot use it on a rate that's above what is listed here, and you can't apply it more frequently than 14 to 21 day intervals. Okay, I have another poll for you. 
And so this is reflective of a California requirement. So we've gone over various sections of the label. So we talked about directions for use, signal word, precautionary statements. So in California, which of these sections of the label is going to help you determine if a closed mixing system is required? And I'll give you a little bit of a hint. This recently changed, I'd say in the last three years, this changed. Oh, I totally stumped you guys. So this is a California requirement, so it's not going to be on the directions for use. Sometimes I have seen some labels that say in the precautionary statements um, that engineering controls are required, but that's very few labels. So in California, if a precautionary statement said fatal if absorbed through the skin, or may be fatal if absorbed through the skin, that means you have to use a closed mixing system. So you have to look at the label in order to comply with the California regulations. So it used to be that all um, pesticides with the signal word danger required a closed mixing system, but that requirement changed like approximately three years ago, but don't, um, don't hold me to that. But now it is the precautionary statement. So you have to see the precautionary statements on the federal label to see if the California requirement applies. And that is fatal if absorbed through the skin or maybe fatal if absorbed through the skin. Okay. So I want to talk just really briefly about the difference between pesticide labels and safety data sheets because we have to use both of these documents in the course of our work. But just remember, you know, a pesticide label is a legal document. Um, it, it, it's an indication that that label, that pesticide is registered by the Federal U Protection Ag Environmental Protection Agency and that it's potentially legal for use in California. Okay, so it's a legal document. It gives you very specific instructions on how to protect yourself when using this pesticide, um, how to protect workers and bystanders when using the pesticide and also exactly how to safely and effectively make that pesticide application, okay? Um, a safety data sheet gives you information about um, safety and hazards. It's very helpful in case of an emergency, like if you have a large pesticide spill, there's a lot of information on that safety data sheet that could be helpful to you. But if you're out in the field, uh, making a pesticide application and trying to protect yourself, bystanders and other workers, the pesticide label is what you do. So uh, safety data sheet is for additional safety information. Pesticide label is a legally binding document with very specific instructions on how to use, on how to use the pesticide. So I have a, another poll for you. So which of the following, so these are two documents that we use, um, but they're not interchangeable. So there's certain information that's on both of them, but not everything, right? So which of the following is found on both the pesticide label and the safety data sheet? EPA registration number, restricted entry interval, active ingredient, pesticide chemical properties, application rate, first aid, chronic symptoms, accidental release measures, and crops or sites of application. So there's more than one right answer here. I think you should be able to uh, choose more than one right answer. Okay. So it looks like most of you thought that the EPA registration number is on both documents and you're correct, right? I told you that's the most important piece of information on the pesticide label and that makes it easy to track and get emergency help. So yes, it's on the safety data sheet as well. So the restricted entry interval is only on a pesticide label. That's a very specific instruction on um, how to use the pesticide and protect work nearby workers, right? So uh, it's not on the safety data sheet, just on the label. Um, you guys are correct in thinking that the active ingredient is on both documents. Um, the pesticide chemical properties is typically only found on the safety data sheet. And that is things like solubility, volatility, flammability. We just don't get um, those specific data on the label. We get sort of instructions on how to avoid those hazards, but we don't get um, the KOC and the solubility and, and all of that stuff. 
Um, the application rate is only on the label. Safety data sheet doesn't help you use the product. It just helps you with safety measures and tells you hazards, right? So first aid is on both documents. You know that it's on the label because we went over that, but also you can find first aid on the safety data sheet. Um, chronic symptoms, if they are there, they are only on the safety data sheet. Um, most of those sections of the safety data sheet that I've seen are like no known chronic symptoms and they just don't have any information at all. Um, spill procedures. Um, so large scale spill, accidental release, that information is much more detailed on a safety data sheet and may not even be found on the label. Sometimes it is. And then crops or sites of application, that's only going to be found on the label. It's really an instruction manual on how to use this product in the field, whereas the safety data sheet is just kind of theoretical hazards and responses. Um, okay, so I have one more poll for you guys. It's poll number nine. Which of the following documents is required to be displayed at a central location so that workers have unimpeded access to it? And this means anytime they're working. So is it the restricted materials permit, the safety data sheet, or the pesticide label? I should have said field workers, just to be more clear, or just workers. We're not always talking about pesticide handlers, but people who work around the pesticide treated fields. It's the safety data sheet. Most of you got that correct. So that's kind of a new requirement. We don't actually, um, well, let's talk about where pesticide labels are required to be, and then we can. Um, so section 6602 of the California Code of Regulation talks about availability of labeling. So it very specifically says a copy of the registered labeling that allows the manner in which the pesticide is being used, blah, 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 blah shall be available at each use site. And there's no specific definition of a use site, which means if the pesticide is being stored, um, you gotta have the pesticide labels there, right? If you're mixing or loading that pesticide, you are using it and you need to have access to the pesticide labels, which makes perfect sense, right? Because if you are mixing a pesticide, you need the label. So, um, you know, so at the use site. So a lot of people keep their pesticide labels in a binder and keep it in a truck, right? Because if you're going from one site to another, making an application of various pesticides, you have to have it where you're going to use that pesticide. So if you're transporting it, mixing, loading, applying, storing, you need to have that label. And so sometimes the label needs to move from one place to another. I would say it needs to stay sedentary in the storage, but if you are mixing, loading, applying in different places, then it needs to move. Um, so just a reminder though, that um, pesticide safety information series, the A8, oh, I should have put a little California thing on this. Um, it says you, it, this is an, um, a document for pesticide handlers. Um, you have the right to look at pesticide use records, applicable pesticide safety series leaflets, and SDS is for all the pesticides used in the last two years where you work. It doesn't actually say pesticide labels here. And if you look at the hazard communication regulation for our handlers, I, I didn't say, I didn't see a specific requirement for labels, but they have to have access, your employees have to have access to pesticide use records, which will have information about the pesticide. So when they're using the pesticide, they have to have the label. Um, but if they're looking at the archived records, they have to have access to pesticide use records, um, SDSs, and, and all of that. And you have to tell them where they're kept and how to access them. Um, so just a reminder, oftentimes, um, this is what a central display could look like and safety data sheets and application specific information are required to be um, displayed here. And so that, has some information from the pesticide label, but it's not an actual pesticide label because those are long and complicated documents. Um, so just a reminder, the label is the law, but that's just the half of it. Um, we've got a lot of additional um, pesticide regulations here in California that go on that label and you have to know what they are. Some of the ones that we talked about were different posting requirements 
different personal protective equipment requirements and um, closed mixing system requirements. So here's some resources for you guys. Um, we have an online training on proper pesticide use to avoid illegal residues and it goes through a lot of label examples. Um, we've got this book, Understanding Pesticide Labels for Making Proper Applications. It's like a spiral bound book. So if you come to one of my trainings, I typically give them out, but you can download the PDF from our website. I've given you the URL. Um, we have it in English and in Spanish. And then over here on the right, you can purchase the Safe and Effective Use of Pesticides book. There's a third edition, so that might be new to some of you guys. Um, so it's got detailed information on pesticide labels, it's got a mock-up label and, and, and lots of information about all the different sections of the label. So uh, this is my contact information. My email is pesticidesafety at ucanr.edu. Um, and if you would like to be notified when we have an in-person training or an online training or, what, or another webinar, um, you can sign up here at the survey. It's ucanr.edu slash train me, um, and you'll just be added to our training list. So we'll send you an email when we've got something going on. So, um, so Lisa, I guess we don't have any questions. So, um, but um, thanks again, everybody for attending and thank you, Lisa, for presenting and um, we will see you at the next one. So have a great afternoon.